I was reading this book and I really, really enjoyed it. It's about Elisabetta Gonzaga, who was Duchess in Urbino at the end of the 15th century till the beginning of the 16th. She was a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, Raffaello, Michelangelo, all the great names of the Renaissance. There is a lot happening in Italy at that time. If you watched my video about Lucrezia Borgia, which I will link up here, you know this time is a crazy time. It's made of violence and great art, of piety and cruelty. What really stuck with me though was the description of all their dresses. The women were always trying their best to be the most elegant and beautiful of them all. She wears a gown of gold material decorated with crimson satin, with sleeves cut in the Castilian fashion, a cloak lined in sable that opens at the throat on a gathered chemise. She has a jewel of big pearls with a ruby pendant and a pear-shaped pearl. On her hair she has a golden cap, but no ribbon. I'm sure their motto was not less is more, but more is more. Midway of reading, there is an appearance of the English ambassador, and I start asking myself what, at this time, the end of the 15th century, was the English fashion for women. Was it the same? Was it different? Because we all remember the Tudor time, we have Henry VIII till Elizabeth I. They all had very definite looks. But the end of the 15th century is a grey area when we think about their fashion. So I started making a bit of a research. Let's go together and see what Italian and English fashion looked like. To start, let's consider Elisabetta Gonzaga, who lived from 1471 to 1526. If we go to England, we find another Elisabetta, very popular name, Elizabeth of York, the Queen, and she was a contemporary of our Italian Elisabetta. She was born in 1466. She died though quite young, in 1503. Let's start from their lifespan to look at the fashion of the time. step, of course, is to look for references. And in the case of Elisabetta, we are very lucky because we have an official portrait of her, so many paintings and frescoes that depicts the latest fashion that it's very easy to reconstruct all the details. Let's give a big thank you to all these people that sponsored churches and chapels or whatever you can imagine to be then depicted themselves in their most expensive clothes. They are perfect fashion plates for us. In the case of England, it's much more difficult. We have an official portrait of Elizabeth, but it's a copy of later years. And to find a painting that shows her in full dress, it's almost impossible. We have many references of French fashion, Spanish fashion or Flemish fashion, which look all very similar to what was going on in England. Finally, though, I found these beautiful figurines that are shown in commemorative brasses that can confirm us what they were actually wearing in England. Let's imagine them getting dressed together. The first layer would be very similar for both of them. We have a camicia for the Italian Elisabetta and a chemise or smock or shirt for the English Elizabeth. Usually it's a garment made out of linen, white, easy to wash. But of course, for this rich gentlewoman, it was possible it was also heavily decorated and of more rich materials like silk. For Elisabetta, probably it would have been a bit wider and fuller because when fully dressed, we still can see a bit of camicia. Showing the white material underneath was a sign of wealth and of course of being very fashionable. Second layer is again very similar for both of them. Elisabetta would wear a gamorra, which is fitted at the waist, very long and sleeveless. The sleeves were separate. Italian ladies, of course, never lost a chance to style themselves up. The detachable sleeves, which was at the beginning a comfort choice to make movement at the elbow and at the shoulder easier, with these very tight sleeves that were not stretchy, becomes later on an excuse to show off. 
They were of different materials and color than the gamorra. That's why we still say today, è un altro paio di maniche. It's another pair of sleeves. To say that it's something completely different. Because, you know, it was a very easy accessory to change completely your look. As we can see in this beautiful example of the ghirlandaio in Florence. Same dress, but different sleeves. Sometimes they were so heavily decorated with gems or gold or silver or of such expensive material that in dowries and possessions were listed under jewellery. And that's a very big difference with what Elizabeth is wearing. Because in England we have the waisted girdle. Hope I'm saying this right. Write it here so we know what we're talking about. It's very similar to the Italian gamorra because it's also fitted at the waist, usually through a front opening that helped to give a bit of an adjustment and a bit of support because remember no brass. As you can see for the English noblewoman the sleeves were not detachable but of course a rich lady couldn't just go out in a simple kirtle or gamorra we wouldn't want that. So for great occasion Elisabetta would have worn a giornea or roba which is a garment that derives from the military. That is why it's sewn at the shoulders, sometimes at the sides and the front, but mostly falls loosely to the floor. If the giornea was the fashion choice for the Italian lady for big occasion, in England the loose gown was always worn on top of the girdle. You say loose, but it's not really loose because it's fitted at the waist again, but it's very ample in the skirt and sometimes also in the sleeves. We have here two different types of fashion. Probably the trend of wider sleeves comes from France. Elizabeth herself, in her own portrait, is wearing tight sleeves with the reversible cuffs that shows fur. Fur was very commonly used to decorate and to trim all the dresses. A thing they had in common, which we don't share with them at all, is their love for contrasting colors. Nothing of the matchy matchy tones that we enjoy so much today. Now to the fun part, or at least my favorite part. Since the 12th century, women had to cover their head. It was to show subservience and humbleness. Women had to accept this, but they made a fashion statement out of this constriction. I mean, look at what was going on in the 15th century. We have the famous headdresses that now we associate to fairies. Amazing. But in England at this point was in fashion the hood. In the rest of Europe on the continent, the French hood was the most popular. Had a round shape and covered your hair and your neck. A major difference with what was going on in England. And I love it because it's the gable hood. It becomes a sort of uniform because it's different from everything else you see at this time. For example, if we look at Margaret of Austria, Duchess of Savoy, she could have gone to the same dressmaker or tailor like Elizabeth, but her hood is different. We will see Catherine of Aragon, daughter-in-law to be to Elizabeth, that will wear the gable hood all her life. When Henry VIII will try to divorce her, it will become her symbol and everyone that supported her will wear it. While the more fashionable and more daring, because it showed more hair, Anne Boleyn will wear the French hood. So looking at the gabled hood, we see it has to be black. That is a must. It is heavily decorated at the front and it has this pointed shape that reminds of a gable. It completely covers your head and the veil covers also your shoulders and part of your neck. So I would say it's quite a modest headdress. While England has its national headdress, in Italy the situation is completely different. You have to know that Italy was not a whole country at the time, unlike England. There were many different states that were under the influences of greater powers. I think that's the reason why there is a lot of originality and a lot of different styles and there is not one headdress. Also, I would say the you must cover your head was taken a bit loosely and a lot of different hairstyles, very fancy, very beautiful, were in fashion. There is this one, for example, which is, was very popular in Florence. Or this little neck 
that gathered your hair at the back, maybe fixed with a ribbon or a cord, or maybe the hair were then braided in colourful ribbons, which we often see in Milan. You could go crazy all the way and cover yourself in pearls and gems, or you could go for the more modest look and cover your head with a fazzoletto, which is a piece of cloth, or a veil if you were older. Then we have the Venetian style. You had so many different choices. One that stands out to me because it's only Italian is the balzo. We can see the balzo already at the beginning of the 15th century, making all his way up to the 16th century, transforming itself, of course. But the concept was of a round crown that reminds us a bit of a turban that could be heavily decorated. We can see, for example, Lucrezia Borgia wearing one here. Last touches for our dressing game is, of course, footwear. Everyone would wear socks or stockings, reaching up to the knees. For shoes, we have a softening of the very pointy shoe that we had at the beginning of the century to a more mild style in that direction. But of course, you couldn't go out in the dirty road with those. So very popular were clogs. In Italy, we also have a very funny development, which is pianelle. Piano means flat, but they were not flat, I can assure you. There had to be lows that forbid them to be higher than a certain amount. Of course, no one really cared. Last but not least, when the weather was cold, which I suspect happened more often in England than in Italy, but still, you used a cloak everywhere, more or less. If we analyse both looks, I can see that Elizabeth in England is more put together. She looks more proper. She doesn't show much skin and her head and neck is covered. All her outfit shows straight lines. But we can see richness in the amount of material and in the softness of the folds of the gown. For the Italian lady or Elisabetta, we have so many different styles and they all look very whimsical and very rich and decorated. She also shows hair and skin with pride. It makes sense to me, as basically the Italian lady was an entertainer. She had, of course, to rule when her husband or father was absent. She had to produce children. But the Italian courts at the end of the 15th century and beginning of the 16th century were famous in all of Europe. They were a center of great culture. Artists and writers of all sorts flocked to these great ladies because they were really good sponsors and patrons of all arts. As said at the beginning, it was much easier to find references, paintings, frescoes about Italian life than about English life. We have also to remember that England just came out of a war, a very long civil war, the War of the Roses. I think they had a bit less time to dedicate themselves to the arts. Elizabeth of York looks the part of the queen that will bring peace and stability. While Elisabetta Gonzaga shows all the creativity and the whimsy of the Renaissance time. I hope you enjoyed this little talk about fashion and history. If you want more, please click like and subscribe to my new channel. Thank you for listening.